Hello and welcome. Uh, this is the discussion for The Awful Truth. I'm sort of running a syllabus through my YouTube and this is our second movie. So this week was uh, this week was Precode and Screwballs. And uh, earlier in this week, we watched Design for Living. Today, uh, we watched The Awful Truth. And we're just going to have a discussion about it. I'm going to try to look right into my... I'm going to try to look right into my camera. I will do my best. And hopefully we can have a really fun back and forth. Uh, feel free to ask me any questions that occur to you or if you just have comments about the film. I want this, it, sound, it feels more like a lecture, but I want it to be more of a forum or a discussion. Um, so if you're so inclined, uh, yeah, just drop a note in the chat and we can get something going. I have a couple of notes that I took myself, obviously, because I'm a nerd and I enjoy the movie. So I have a couple of talking points that I'm going to go through uh, and just chime in as you like. Uh, let me just check something for a second. All right. Um, so there are a couple of things that we can definitely talk about. In my video, I mentioned just a uh, couple of the questions that I specifically wanted wanted us to think about while we watch the movie. Um, one of the major themes of the movie is fidelity that I didn't talk about in my in my video at all. Um, but there is this ongoing question of who should be believed, who's culpable. They never really answer whether what Jerry was doing when he wasn't in Florida, which is very strange because he has to apologize at the end to Irene, not Irene, uh, to Lucy. So it's Jerry and Lucy, but I just keep thinking of them as Carrie and Irene. Um, so Jerry has to apologize to Lucy at the end, and it's sort of well-earned. You sort of want them to be together and Irene has already forgiven him and realized that she does care about him and he realizes that he's been an idiot but for being jealous and whatever but Irene never really gets a come up in the way that Jerry was misbehaving Jerry sort of ruined their marriage because he didn't trust her and then he was also off doing Florida things and she caught him in a lie and he never really apologized for that or explained what he was doing at that time. So that's not great. Um, I would say that that's not the basis of another marriage. I was hoping that at the very end he would explain what, what was going on, but he didn't. So one of the things we can talk about is fidelity and whether the couple are really truly equally matched. I think they are in terms of the the pleasure that they get in screwing with each other's lives. They're definitely smart enough for each other. They're definitely clever and mean enough for each other even. Um, and I guess that kind of gets, I guess that kind of gets into the question of whether this movie is romantic or not, because I find that the characters are extremely cynical and the way that they, the way that the movie frames marriage um you know they, they they say that line um that marriage is based on faith and they uh can't uh, a marriage can't survive if uh you're constantly questioning the other person and that's definitely true and it definitely seems like a message that married people should have but then throughout the movie you kind of get that feeling that marriage isn't necessarily all that great. Um, they don't particularly like being, they do like being married to each other, but they have that scene where, um, not Irene, uh, they have that scene where Lucy is calling the lawyer and the lawyer is saying, well, you know, marriage is a sacred institution and people don't give it a fair rap and you should really consider it. And then they keep undermining it because his wife is an annoying nag or whatever, um, which also isn't very fair to women. But despite that, the movie does have a sort of romantic core at the end that, you know, these characters are sort of perfectly rotten for each other or they're just fun for each other. They kind of enjoy getting into scrapes and their, life's, their life is exciting and they're sort of too smart for everyone else in the room at all times. And you kind of really enjoy seeing them together because they're so equally matched. Um, 
I guess I am eventually coming down on this idea that they're they're equally cynical, but their equal cynicism is romantic in a way um, because they are sort of meant for each other. Um, the other thing, okay. Um, the other, uh, oh, this is different. Um, I did find, oh, okay. <laughs> um, a lot of crinkling papers and distracting noises there. So I did find that uh, in terms of modernity versus timelessness, that uh, there wasn't this film, seeing it this time, it seemed a little bit more backward than, than, um, than I've seen it in the past. Uh, I generally see, because Lucy is such an engaging character and she's such a force of nature, I generally see it more positively, positively, I generally see it more positively. Um, I do think that it's very much of its time period. There are definitely scenes where you can tell it's of its time period. Um, there are moments that kind of strike me as little spots of modernity in the sense that audiences of today can still sort of relate to it. There was um, the idea that the excuse of your car breaking down was already old by the 30s, which was only 20 years after the car became mass produced or whatever. Uh, I don't know the exact dates. Please don't burn me at the stake for that. Um, I think Ford was 1908, 1911. Anyway, um, I am not the car enthusiast. So because... Um, so there's sort of those little spots of humor of, you know, oh, already these things are tired. Um, these rich people are very bored of everything. They're all always looking for entertainment and novelty. Uh, I think that's sort of a trope that gets used a lot, but it's a very, because they're always looking for novelty, it creates this very, you know, what's hip, what's now, what's happening right now, a very um, of the moment style. Uh, and so these rich people are obsessed with modernity and it comes through in the movie. Um, there are a couple of other moments that felt very um, comedically modern, not necessarily in the sense that the movie itself was being modern, but there are some, it, a lot of the movie was improv. I was just doing reading on this last night. It was through Wikipedia. So uh, I'll again, again, do not burn me at the stake. I was not doing real academic research. I was just going down a wiki hole. But um, a lot of the movie actually came from the actors. And so that's why you get a lot of overlapping dialogue. I think it it's hard to imagine that some of the lines were improvised the way that they were because they work so perfectly. But at the same time, I sort of believe that Cary Grant and Irene Dunn are geniuses. And so I kind of, um, the one that sticks out to me that seems there's no, like there's no way that someone didn't write it is at the very beginning when, um, uh, oh, when, when the voice teacher says something like, oh, well, no one's ever accused me of being a great lover. And Lucy goes, oh yeah, uh, yeah no one could possibly accuse you of being a great lover. And that just seems, it could, I guess it could have come out in rehearsal or something, but it seems too too much of a written. It seems too much of a literary joke, maybe, or too much of a written joke. Um, so I have personal curiosity about that one, or who improvised that one. I heard that most of the cast improvised their own dialogue, um, and you can really tell that sometimes, especially near the end, um, when Cary Grant is on the phone with his wife, Barbara, I kind of want to call her Barbara. I always think of Barbara Stanwyck and I don't, I know it's not her. Oh, I know the actress isn't her, but I know that she's not trying to be a stand in for Barbara Stanwyck or whatever. It just, I think her name might be Barbara. And um, maybe it's cause like the, her hairstyle is very much of the way. Um, uh, yeah, but the, 
Um, uh, uh, oh, hi. <laughs> I totally missed you and now you're gone. That's great. Um, so the way that they... Um, Oh, the way that Lucy's dialogue kept overlapping with Jerry's and the way she sort of egged him on. And she keeps, uh, Irene Dunn has this great way of just sort of like muttering a line and throwing it away. And that's a very, not modern, but um, it seems like modern humor. I know that's existed for a long time, but it seems sort of humor that's very popular now or popular again now. Um, I know that like, people just don't like invent commentator or whatever. Um, it's been around for a long time, but it seems like it would play very well with audiences. Now a little bit of the cringe humor at the very end um, with Lucy pretending to be a ne'er-do-well sister and really sort of ruining Jerry's day and Jerry's date and embarrassing him in front of his fiance's parents. That seems very much um it, cringe humor kind of peaked in the 90s but we still get a lot of it now um 90s was mostly gross out humor and this is less gross out and more just like sitting with how awkward this is and how embarrassing it is for everyone else and not being able to really contain that and it really struck me as you know um something that you might see in uh, it's not napoleon dynamite but something that you might see in like an indie film today. So that was a really interesting touch of modern humor. Um, hello, one person watching. Um, if you have any questions about the film, I, I don't know if you've seen The Awful Truth, but um, if you have any questions about it, feel free to say something in the chat. Um, ask me questions or give me feedback or whatever. I'm just gonna keep reiterating that a couple of times um, for people who are new or who come in. Um, so the um, there there wasn't necessarily some the film seems timeless in the sense that it's still funny. It's the scene where Cary Grant runs into the bedroom and sees the other guy and gives his bowling gives his uh, bowler hat over gets me every single time. And I think a lot of it is the economy of the way that they shoot it and the way the choices that they make because it's a. a it's an entirely uh, silent sequence from Carrie's point of view. You can hear Lucy out talking um, to someone else, but the slow realization is a total silent movie and it really carries over every single time because there is something, not to break down comedy because I know that's like the worst thing that you can do, but there's something about knowing something <laughs> that um, another character does it and watching them realize it and realizing how bad that is for them um, is really exciting and always, they're, they're, it just always hits home. Um, it's always the funniest moment for me. And then the fact that you don't actually see their fight um, and you get to imagine it and it's sort of chaos going on in the background. Um, it's just a spectacular moment of the film. It's really, that's really the moment where the film sort of, not that, um, not the finding its feet, but that's the moment it becomes a screwball comedy, I think, um, because it's so ridiculous and out there. Um, let's see. Um, a couple of things were up and it, so a, a big theme of this one is disruption, not necessarily of society or the way, um, or the story of romantic comedies. It's actually a pretty standard romantic comedy, especially for its time. Like I said, it, um, it pretty well encapsulates this idea of, um, the comedy of remarriage, so they could def so the film could talk about sex in a way um, without having it be premarital sex, and so they can still um, feature sort of uh, interesting things or have the woman be a, like a worldly lady or be aware of the world um, without her like losing her uh, precious uh, whatever. Um, without losing her innocence in some, or she can be not innocent, but not unlawful or not unlovely. So um, what, whatever weird social standards you want to put on that time. Um, 
but there is an ongoing theme of them disrupting each other's lives. Um, they definitely go out of their way to disrupt each other's lives. And it's not just one sided one. Go, uh, uh, Jerry goes to disrupt Lucy's life. And then Lucy rounds out the film doing everything she can to disrupt Jerry's. And it's this interesting idea of the people who are made for each other don't necessarily go with the flow of your life. They sort of are instigators in your life. Um, and uh, they're disruptive to your life that, that um, the people who are really important are disruptive to your life in some way. Um, they challenge you. Uh, they um, show up unexpectedly. Uh, I think that idea of um, someone that, that the love of your life or someone that you're in love with being a challenge to you is really inherent in screwball comedies. I think that they have... Um, Hello. Hello, one person. Um, uh, I think that uh, having the challenge of um, someone else, that's sort of how you propel the story forward. That's how um, you get into all the different hijinks. Um, but having the, the challenger it's sort of this idea of um, you're not really living your life unless someone's pushing you out of your comfort zone, um, confronting you with things that you're not comfortable with um, or confronting things that you don't want to confront. And that those people help you grow in a way that someone who is sort of nice and pleasant and stable, um, there's this thing about like, oh, you know, the dude, the, the oil rig dude was uh, a bit of a, was a bit dumb but he was he certainly was stable and he was nice and he was doting and he was a proper gentleman um he was very sweet but he was right he wasn't right for lucy because he would have been sort of like marrying uh, he would have been sort of like marrying a dog um he wouldn't challenge her in any way her life would have ceased to be exciting and jerry provides that ex excitement through constantly disrupting her life. Uh, I don't know if that's a good message or not. I don't know. It, it kind of makes sense. But at the same time, I, I think in the long run, uh, that would kind of suck to be married to someone who's constantly undermining you or getting in your way and not letting you achieve things. Um, I think specifically for this film, it probably makes sense because the thing that they were trying to undermine was um, the other person marrying someone else um uh and then i just i have even more notes um and then i just took some notes that i wanted to talk about just little things um during while i was watching the film that struck me um these are all over the place so the first thing is that her fur coat amazing <laughs> i am in love with that coat um it, it gives her shoulders like out to here she looks like a bird she looks it, like her head is like above a fluffy little cloud um basically everything that she wears in that film is fantastic i want her entire wardrobe it's all shiny it's all perfectly fitted um there's there's this one outfit where she's wearing um like a top half of a coat with like tails and then she has pants and like the top half is like white with plaid, like a plaid or a square thing on it. Um, the pattern is outrageous. And then her pants are like billowy pants, but they also like drag on the floor. So you can't see her heels or anything. It's every, every time she showed up on screen with a new outfit, I was just over, <laughs> over the moon excited to see what else she would wear. Um, her hairstyle changes all the time. The one, the two that stick out to me are definitely, um, there's one where she sort of has her uh, hair up and curls up here and she looks sort of like someone from the Wizard of Oz just because that was the style at the time. But um, it's like her, the rest of her hair is down with like curls at the bottom and then she just has like little two scroll curls up here. Um, and that kind of struck me as the worst hairstyle, but the best one was definitely the one um, when she's uh, when Jerry is about to marry someone else, and he gets uh, she like they toast to each other. Um, she's sort of doing a low key li uh, Statue of Liberty cosplay. Um, she has like a very nice, well put together outfit, and she has her 
little Statue of Liberty hat that's like flipped over, but it sort of looks like a crown and her hair is just like really great there. It's just like down and curls and it's just like perfectly, everything fits perfectly together. Um, so that is Lena's movie fashion to corner. Uh, um, uh, a lot of the disruption happens in front of their friends. So there's this element of social embarrassment too, especially at the beginning. Um, it's that the, what's exacerbating the scene is that their rich, sassy, catty friends are watching their marriage sort of fall apart. There's a lot of, um, you know, what old are the people back home think? Or, you know, I heard from a friend of a friend that you were cheating with the voice instructor. So it's, um, it's, especially in this movie, um, and not that I've heard, not that I've noticed a lot in um, other screwball comedies, there's a lot of, not he, well, I mean, it is a he said, she said, but there's a lot of, attention paid to um, uh, not just society in general, but a friend group, a circle of friends, um, and the, so the sort of social embarrassment you get by not really um, having it together. Um, I also want to bring up this idea because I just talked about it, of this um, catty versus cynical because a lot of her friends are very catty or a lot of their friends are very catty. Uh, Lucy is especially catty in the first scene. They sort of never stop being sniping at each other. Um, I wonder for me if that's um, a representation of cynicism or it's just the way that people talk to each other. I mean, people are cynical and that's they talk to the, each other that way, but I was wondering if it was just sort of... Um, if they're just being mean or they're being cynical or they're being both. Um, and I have, what is this film stance on marriage? But we already talked about that. We talked about the bedroom brawl. Um, and, oh, uh, I did talk about this a little bit before, but um, Lucy does just, Irene just does a really great job of having like these little bits of like running commentary, like, um, Carrie will say something and she'll just like, like that wasn't blah, 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 but it'll be a joke. Um, and, and like, it, you can see like the wheels turning in the character's head. Um, and it's just a really nice touch specific to the movie. I don't, I haven't, I saw her in Roberta. Um, I, and I saw her in the awful wife in the awful wife, <laughs> my favorite wife. Um, and I don't remember her doing those things either. I haven't seen Penny Serenade yet because uh, I'm not quite ready for a tearjerker and to have my life ruined forever. So that's a movie that I haven't been able to catch. Um, but that's the third Cary Grant and Irene Dunn movie. So I've seen her in a couple of other things. And I don't remember having... I don't remember her having that aspect to her performance. I think that's specifically this movie. And one of the reasons why this movie did so well, why it won so many Oscars, which it did. Um, and I think Leo McCary, who was the director, I think he might've won best director as well. So it was an incredibly successful film, which is hilarious because bringing a baby completely tanked. Um, and I think that was the movie why they, uh, that was the movie that um, why they called Catherine Hepburn box office poison. It was after bringing up baby. Uh, so don't read reviews. <laughs> like, just don't do it. Just come up with your own uh, idea. Of, <laughs> just watch the movie yourself. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then marriage is based on faith, which is something that I already covered a bit. So um, if you guys have any questions, um, I am here to answer them. Or if you want to say hi, or if you have any sort of discussion, um, I am out. Like I'm, I'm here to talk about the film. Um, but I have, I am out of show notes as, as they are. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and not show notes. I am out of my live streaming notes. So I think, um, it seems like we have a silent person. Um, so in case you were, um, if you have anything to ask, you can contact me. Oh, does that sound a lot better? That probably sounds a lot better. Whoops. Uh, I will know that for the future. I'm wondering where exactly my phone went. There it is. Um, yeah, so... Um, unless you guys have any questions, I think that is it for us tonight. Thank you for joining me for the, this discussion. I'm going to put it up on um, my site 
uh, I, hopefully this is being recorded. I think it's being recorded. I think that's the way that YouTube works. Um, so hopefully I'm going to have this up on my site uh, pretty soon. You can come back, uh, look at the things that we discussed, and then bring that into next week. Next uh, For next week, uh, for Sunday, today is Sunday, for Wednesday, we're watching Singing in the Rain because we're getting into our second week, and that's going to be mid-century and satire. So I know I've seen the movie millions and millions and millions of times. I can probably recite the entire movie to you. Um, and if you've seen it before, uh, it might be a good chance to revisit it again. Um, I'm going to have specific questions that I'm going to ask. I'm going to try to get it up on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. Uh, fingers crossed that I can do that in time. Um, so I'm going to try to give people a couple of extra days to see it if possible because I know that like a one day turnaround is a bit hard. I do try to watch them um, at the when I go on at 8 30. I do try to watch them from six to eight but I know that other people have different schedules and everything, but I, that window is the one that I recommend to watch the movie just so you come into these discussions fresh. Um, but if you uh, want to join us for that, that would be great. <laughs> um, and I will have this up on my channel, uh, probably slightly edited, and I will have the new video up on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday uh, latest Wednesday, but I'll have the new video up probably on Tuesday. So thanks for joining and I hope you have a great night. Uh, I don't have a log off soon. We're going to try to organically develop that one. So uh, I hope that uh, you have a great night and see you later.